Well, hi there. This is the Australian Outdoors. Sunlight, blue sky, wonderful. A great day for a video. I'm Graham. Today, I'm in Greystains, a little southwest of Parramatta, and about to explore the Booth Town Aqueduct. Come with me, and together we'll discover the Booth Town Aqueduct. The Booth Town Aqueduct was completed in 1888 as a part of the Lower Prospect Canal convey water east from Prospect Reservoir to Sydney residents via Potts Hill at Siguna. The canal was an open canal that carried water by gravity using a fall of 6 inches per mile, that is 15 centimetres per 1.6 kilometres, and as such it was necessary to build this aqueduct to maintain water flow over a small unnamed valley here in Greystains. The aqueduct was originally named the Boothtown Aqueduct after John Booth, but is now often called the Greystains Aqueduct. Mr Booth was one of the best known men in the district, and for some years was the Mayor of the Municipal District of Prospect in Sherwood. Mr Booth in the early days was also a prominent cricketer, when the great rival teams were Parramatta, Sydney, Maitland and Windsor. He was also a keen judge of good cattle and was one of the most successful breeders in the district. He died on the 31st of July, 1900, at the age of 66. Once built, the aqueduct became the longest continuous concrete work of its kind in Australia throughout the late 19th and early 20th century. Constructed of sandstone brick, it measures 225 metres in length. It has 22 arches and each with a 9 metre span. Pretty impressive, huh? In the 1900s, the aqueduct was threatened with demolition, but thanks to objections by the local community, the aqueduct and surrounding reserve area were saved and ultimately included as part of the Western Sydney Cycle Network. The aqueduct was in use from 1888 to 1907. That's only 19 years. Why was that? Although not the primary cause, it was reported in the Sydney newspapers of 1892 that, early on the morning of Saturday, the 9th of January, sensational rumours were current to the fact that the Prospect Dam had given way. And although this statement was not generally accepted, it soon became evident that a serious mishap had occurred. It appears that, during the previous night, it was thought that between 3 and 4 o'clock, some 60 metres of the aqueduct's northern wall, about 3 metres in height, collapsed and fell into the watercourse below. Experts stated that the cause of the break was too heavy pressure of water being sent through to fill Potts Hill Reservoir at the daily rate of 79.5 million litres a day. As a consequence of this enormous body of water going through the aqueduct, the water rose higher in the viaduct than ever before and percolated through the top courses and gaining strength carried away the side of the structure. 
walls were constructed and re-strengthened with a concrete lining and tie rods. Now the main reason the aqueduct was decommissioned was by 1907 Sydney needed more water than the aqueduct could carry. So on the 20th of March, at the recommendation of the engineer in chief, the Water and Sewage Board approved the construction of an inverted siphon to bypass the aqueduct. When the siphon was operational, instead of demolition, the Boothstone Aqueduct was retained as a standby. Once the siphon was operational, instead of demolition, the Boost Town Aqueduct was retained as a standby. Let's take a look at one end of the siphon. To complement the grandeur of the aqueduct, the 1907 inverted siphon, called fondly enough the Booth Town Siphon, was built with inlets resembling castle towers made of rendered brick and doorways that are lancet arched. Here is an illustration of how an inverted siphon works. Once the siphon was completed, the aqueduct was blocked with concrete plugs to divert water into the siphon and into a large concrete pipe 3 metres in diameter. The castle structure was equipped with steel trash racks and sluice gates to control the water flow. This then is the west tower inlet to the inverted siphon. The east tower is the outlet. The canal was filled in in the late 1900s and the concrete cycleway we see here today was placed on top. Behind us, we can see the cycleway across the aqueduct, but when it was first used, it carried water in its V-shaped canal to a depth of 1.7 metres. But it could rise to, two, to a maximum of 2 metres. Of course, that maximum capacity was reached in 1892, which caused the accident I mentioned earlier. And so it goes on. Sydney's population kept increasing and drinking more water. Over time, the lower canal capacity was increased to its maximum capacity, a huge 379 million litres per day. By 1927, more Sydney siders were washing and taking long baths. So, a 1.4 metre diameter wood stave main was completed from the Nepean's upper canal, not far from where it ended Prospect Reservoir, all the way to Potts Hill, Laguna, and delivered an additional 190 million litres per day. Sydney then had 570 million litres of water a day to play in. Later in 1937, that main was replaced by a 1.8 metre diameter steel main with a capacity of 320 million litres per day. All this because it was hot and people wanted to water their lawns. In 1958, when Warragamba water became available, a 2 metre diameter steel pipeline was commissioned between Prospect and Potts Hill with a capacity of 340 million litres per day. By my counting, Sydney was then using three water lines, the canal with 379 million litres, the upgraded pipeline from Prospect with 320 million litres, and the pipeline from Warragamba carrying 340 million litres. That's a total capacity of 1,039 million litres of water. In more modern times, work on the Prospect Reservoir and Lower Canal diversion was completed. The Lower Canal's function was replaced by a 3 metre diameter concrete line steel pipe encased in a tunnel, running below ground from Prospect to Pipehead. That greatly increased the reliability, water quality and level of water flow. With the canal and siphon bypassed, the Lower Canal was decommissioned and drained in 1996. The Prospect Reservoir became a storage rather than a service reservoir and was kept as a backup water supply to compensate for demand fluctuations or supply failure. This ends our escapade today. If you enjoyed our day out, please subscribe to 
this channel. If you haven't, click the notification bell so that you'll be notified when we next upload a video. And like this one if you did. See you on my next adventure. Bye for now.